Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. It's a gray, cold day, and there's rain in the forecast, cast, but we'll try to squeeze this in uh, before I get wet. Put yourself in my shoes. 20 years ago, I, as a doctor, volunteered halfway around the world. A few days after I arrived there, I got called to the hospital. A mother was in labor premature labor and the baby was struggling. The nurses had detected fetal distress and they wanted me to come and consult. <clears throat> My immediate re reaction was get the OR ready. Let's do a c-section. Let's save this baby. I gave the orders but nobody moved. And finally the nurses said uh, Dr. Scott we don't do that here this baby is going to die anyhow. We have to save the mother. A few late hours later, the baby was born, stillborn, and I was in shock. I, I didn't know how to make decisions. I didn't know how to, how, how do you take care of people when, when you are making decisions to let babies die? The next night I was called to the hospital again. A mother had delivered and was bleeding. So I came, I attended to her, we got the bleeding stopped. I turned around to leave and discovered on the table next to the bed a baby, another premature baby, just left there, unattended. I touched it, it was cold, it was barely breathing. What would you do? I'll tell you what I did. I unbuttoned my shirt. I tucked that baby next to my skin. I told the nurses, get a hot water bottle. We've got to warm this baby up. There was a whispered conversation and then one of them left the room. A half hour later, she came back with a hot water bottle. I carefully warmed up a blanket with the hot water bottle wrapped it around the baby, put, it, put the baby into a bassinet, taught the nurse how to measure the temperature every 15 minutes and adjust the distance of the water bottle from the baby to keep the temperature constant. I went back to my bed that night and I felt good. I had saved a life and, and I had, I had um, adapted our American knowledge to this primitive system where we were using hot water bottles instead of, instead of temperature controlled uh, um, bassinets to help babies stay, maintain their temperature. I drifted off to sleep and in the morning when I woke up, I got to the hospital and the medical director called me into his office. He said, Steve, I understand why you did what you did last night, but do you understand what you did? I was confused. I had saved a life. He said, um, when you asked that nurse to get a hot water bottle, she had to go home and start a fire with the firewood that she had collected to feed her family for this week. She warmed the water herself at home. Last night, to keep that baby warm, she burned her entire week's worth of firewood the firewood that was supposed to feed her family, firewood that she will not be able to replenish until her next day off when she goes back into the bush to chop the wood herself. Now the staff are not gonna let that family starve. They are going to either feed that family or loan them firewood, but that means the entire community is going to run out of firewood before the end of the week. Because you asked that nurse to check the temperature every 15 minutes, she did not have time to administer medications or to monitor the other patients. 
this morning we found a patient dead in their bed because they hadn't had the nursing care. Now you understand what you did. I collapsed into a chair, okay? I mean, I was, I was doubly in shock now. How do I function? What do I do? I, would, I was living a nightmare. What we think of as normal is highly dependent on our context, on the resources at hand. Do you remember back in the day when the milkman used to come and deliver door, uh, deliver milk door to door? The milkman disappeared when we bought refrigerators to put into our house. Or what about walking to church? Do you remember when church was close enough that you could just walk to church? Cars have transformed our church going habits just as much as they've transformed our work habits and our shopping habits. Times have changed, our expectations have changed, normal has changed, but take away our refrigerators, take away our cars, and a new normal would have to evolve. It would be painful, it would be fitful, we would scream and kick, but a new normal would have to, be, have to evolve. 20 years ago, when I stepped from my world here in America into that world, I was living a nightmare. And that nightmare is being repeated again and again across America today. Put yourself in my shoes again. I'm a doctor. I'm working in a rural emergency room. Joe comes in. My neighbor comes in with crushing chest pain. I do the appropriate testing. I, I determine that he's having a heart attack. I can administer aspirin. That's the first thing you do with a heart attack. It saves lives. Some. I can even administer clot buster medicine to reopen, to dissolve the clot and get rid of, and or get blood flowing back to the heart again. But that only works about 40% of the time. And standard of care is that if I administer that medicine, I need to immediately transfer him to a larger hospital that has heart cath capacity that can do emergency heart surgery. So I pick up the phone and I call my closest heart, heart hospital. Sorry, we don't have any beds. We're not accepting transfers. I dial the next hospital. Same thing. The next hospital, the next hospital, the next hospital. Today in America, sometimes heart patients are having to be transferred six hours drive away. Think about it. How far would six hours of driving take you? That's how far hospitals and patients are having to transfer via ambulance to get people to the appropriate level of care because the hospitals are full. Here in Southern Illinois, for, the, for more than half of this week, we have not been able to transfer patients. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we just shove them in a corner and say, you die, can't do nothing for you. No, we use the tools that we have available. We use them absolutely as much as we can. Our doctors and our nurses are fighting for lives. Knowing that they are unable to deliver the standard of care that they could one week ago and that people are dying About right now, you're saying, oh, this can't be real. This is America. He's exaggerating. This, trust me, it is happening. And I'm not exaggerating. The same nightmare that I lived 20 years ago, that I lived through and learned to adapt to, 
doctors and nurses across America, patients across America, families across America are having to crash land into with one big difference. When that happened to me, I was surrounded by people who had already adjusted to the situation, who had learned how to best take care of people, who knew that they were being good doctors and good nurses, even though they didn't have the resources of an affluent nation. Today, our doctors and nurses don't have that advantage. They are surrounded with people whose expectations are still that milk will be delivered to the door or that they can open a refrigerator door and pull it out. They're surrounded by people who were saying, there's no crisis. What do you mean you're not getting my grandpa taken care of? Now don't, don't, don't take me wrong here, okay? We're in a hard situation. And what I experienced 20 years ago, those people who had adjusted to the situation, they weren't calloused. They mourned those babies who died unnecessarily. Those fathers who, 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 who's, who's died from heart attacks with, that could have been prevented if the resources had been available. They mourned them, but they didn't condemn themselves. Today, we have doctors and nurses committing suicide because they feel evil. They feel hopeless and helpless. Twenty years ago, as I faced that nightmare, I experienced grace. Grace is the way we live our lives. Grace shields us from harm. Grace bears our burdens. Grace defends us even if we are guilty. Grace suffers the cost at a personal level of the messes we make. And grace mourns right along with us as we face the impossible. Why does grace do this? Because people trump winning arguments. People trump being right and looking good. Last week, I challenged you to practice the three W's as an act of grace. Wash your hands, watch your distance. Wear your masks as an act of grace. This week, I am begging you. I don't care if you're spiritual and not religious. I don't care if you're religious. Live a life of grace. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week. And I'm getting out of the rain now. <laughs>